We are um, continuing our Friday night Vespers program each Friday evening at 6.30, and oh, what a blessing that is. We had, I think, 22 people, 22 people at Vespers last night, and um, next Friday evening we'll have Vespers again, and I believe we're going to be covering... My mind just went blank. We're covering something exciting and you can't miss it. So if you want to know what we're covering, come Friday. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Okay, so Friday evenings, they begin at 6.30. Next Sabbath, we're going to be having communion. And it is a good practice the week before communion to spend that week preparing your heart. How can you prepare your heart for communion? Well, one thing you can do is say, is there anything between God and myself that is out of harmony? Is there anything that God wants me to do that I'm not doing? Is there anything that God is convicting me of that I'm trying to shove aside? This week is the week to take care of those things between you and the Lord because you want to come to communion with a clean heart and a... Uh, a clean conscience. So prepare, you know, pray to the Lord as David prayed. Search my heart, O Lord, and see if there is any wicked way in me. So make your relationship right with the Lord now before communion. The second thing that's important to do before communion is to say, Lord, is there anything that I have against one of my brothers or sisters? Is there anything I have against a fellow member or co-worker or somebody in my family, now's the week to make those things right uh, the best that you can. This is how we prepare for communion. And really, preparing for communion is, uh, is like preparing for the second coming of Jesus. Because these are the sorts of things that we need to do before Jesus comes again. So communion will be next week. Our nominating committee will be meeting tomorrow from 10.30 a.m. till 5 p.m. So please keep our nominating committee in prayer as we prayerfully consider different names. We also have our church directory that is coming out for 2018. Um, you'll notice that we're missing a lot of people's pictures. So hopefully... We'll be able to get more pictures coming in the, in the next few months and update the directory and have another copy ready for you by Christmas. That's my hope. Um, but if you want a paper copy of the directory, those are available in the information booth. If you want a digital copy, we just created a new area on our website called Members Resources. It's password protected. So you're going to need the password. I'm not going to share the password from up front here. So if you want the password to be able to access members' resources on our church website, they have that password in the information booth. So make sure that you get that from the information booth. And then you can download a free copy of the uh, church directory to your phone or tablet or computer or wherever you would like. Um, the Paper copies that we have are not stapled. We, we couldn't find a stapler that staples books. So, and we didn't want to mess up your copies by bending them all over the place. So this week we're going to order a stapler. Next week we can have those copies stapled. If it doesn't matter to you whether it's stapled or not, you can pick up an unstapled version at the information booth. But that is completely up to you. And then next Saturday in the evening at 5.30, I think it's 5.30, it's either 5 or 5.30, um, Elder Carl Parker will be sharing a concert and a special Vespers program called Carl Parker and Friends Vespers. So please mark those things down. And if you're not on our Friday email newsletter, if you're not getting our Friday newsletter through email, please give your email address and your name and information to Shannon White. Or you can leave it at the information booth and you can get all of these announcements and more 
through email every Friday. Um, I think that's all. So let's go ahead and ha have our children come forward at this time for our children's story, and we'll begin our service. Good morning, children. I have a special story for you, and I have something I want to show you. Okay. How many of you have, have, have your parents have a garden? And you grow things? Do you I know? have one. Okay. You know that there's lots of things that grow in a garden, right? Depending on what you plant, right? And sometimes there are surprises in the garden as well. Here's a surprise. Hidden under the leaves for a while. Where is the end? There it is. Okay. Can you hold the bag for me? Okay. Can you hold the bag for me? I can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, look at this. This was in someone's garden. Look at this. Huh? Is that neat? Yeah. Kind of looks like a swan from the top, doesn't it? That is it's huge, but it looks kind of like a swan, but the body is pretty long, huh? Yeah, and it looks like a bat at the bottom <laughs> or a swan at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I've never seen a squash like this, but this is a, a variety of squash, but it doesn't normally grow like this. But it was hidden for a time, and so when the person saw it, it was one of our members who moved, she decided, um, wow, this looks really interesting, and she thought maybe you would like to see this. It's pretty amazing, huh? I've never seen an un unusual looking squash like this. Some of them, when you let them grow too long, you know, they get very, very large, huge. Okay, but this is an interesting thing. It kind of looks like a swan to me, but the body is a little small. And it, what doesn't it have to be a swan? <laughs> it and looks it like a snake. Has, and then it also looks like this is the part of the head, like it's eating a big snake. It might be the long part. He needs two eyes and, and maybe feathers. Well, you know, <laughs> it needs a lot of things in order to be a swan, but it's not a swan, is it? No, you know it's not a swan, but it just looks like one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know what, I'm, I brought this to show you just to give an example of something that looks like something, but it really isn't, and you know, in Jesus' days, the, remember the religious leaders and how, how they, they were very strict with their rules, and they wore nice robes, and they looked like they were, they were very solemn and they believed in Jesus but you know what their acts they look like they believed but they their acts were not the same what did they do hmm? they they killed Stephen and they killed who else Jesus yes, yes. yes they killed Jesus too and they put people in prison so they weren't looking like they were looking like they were the children of God, but their actions were not, were they? Just like this looks like something, something we, we if our imaginations go that far, but um, it looks like something, but we know that it isn't. And so their actions speak louder. And these religious leaders did terrible things. They did terrible things. So remember that that there are things in nature you can learn from just and you can just kind of compare them and read the bible and you can see see things in your mind more clearly you know these are just examples but i want you to know that in order to be a christian you have to be like who jesus you have to be like jesus that's right and you you don't just look like jesus or pretend like you think you love him but you have to be like him that means you do the things he does, right? And what is that? He loves everyone. And do you he all? Loves the squash. Mm -hmm. a long one. Yes, he loves the squash. And it also looks like he's eating a 
Okay. Yes. And so we want to all be like Jesus. We want to do what? Obey our parents, our mother and our father. Do we obey our parents? Do we all obey our parents? Yes. Okay. And you want to love one another? And you want to love, love your neighbor as yourself. Very good. Yes. And we also, we also want to be just like Jesus. Okay. So thank you for listening very quietly. Okay. And let us just pray and say a word of thanks to God. Okay. Would you like to pray? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for the wonderful day, and thank you that you for the Sabbath day, and always you can always do for me, and we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, and don't forget to go down all the aisles. There's four aisles, okay? Join me in kneeling as we invite the Lord's presence together. Our Heavenly Father, we, we are in desperate need of your Holy Spirit this morning. Fill us, Lord, and lead us closer to you, we pray. Bless our service as we offer it to you. We pray in Christ's name, amen. church family oh happy sabbath <laughs> jeremiah 29 12 and 13 says when you call to me and come to plead with me i will listen to you when you seek me you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart i invite you that we together seek god with all of our heart today by turning to him number eight we gather together him number eight We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and he sends his will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. 
he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, the Lord will set our side, all glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou still a defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation, thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. Amen. Our next hymn of worship will be number 327, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Number 327. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held in sin's trans I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be Spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of the vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than Let's all stand and worship our Maker and our King. Let's turn to hymn number 1-5. Hymn number 15, My Maker and My King.
My maker and my king, to thee I all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. The creature of thy hand, on thee alone I live. My God, thy benefits deem and more praise than I can give. My God, thy benefits deem and more praise than I can give. Lord, what can I impart when all is then before? Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift alas how poor. Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift, alas, how poor. Oh, let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. Let every wood and each desire in all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. You may be seated. Good morning, and happy Sabbath. This morning's uh, tithes and offerings is for the Oregon Conference and for you support. In a school, Boston School, a committee directed that the following commandments be read bi-weekly to pupils in grades 7 through 12. Don't let your parents down. They brought you up. Stop and think before you drink. Be smart. Obey. You'll give orders yourself someday. Show off driving is juvenile. Don't act your age. Ditch dirty thoughts fast, or they will ditch you. Pick the right friends to be picked for a friend. Choose a date fit for a mate. Don't go steady unless you're ready. Love God and neighbor. Live carefully. The soul you save may be your own. Let us pray. Dear Blessed Father, we are so thankful for your love and for your goodness and for your mercy. Father, we need you more now than ever. May your Holy Spirit bless our youth, yes. for they are living in a time of tumultuous, contradictory messages, images, beliefs, and the leaders are the example. Lord, help our leaders be the right example. Bless our youth. Strengthen them that they may follow you. Obey your commandments. Grow in grace. We thank you, Lord, we pray. In the blessed and holy name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
are going to sing our prayer song before we kneel for intercessory prayer. It is found on the inside of your bulletin. whose health is permitting, please kneel with me for our intercessory prayer. Gracious God, it is a joy to see the faces of brothers and sisters as we came together to worship you this morning. Thank you for this wonderful gift of Sabbath in which indeed you are gathering us, giving us peace of mind and peace in our hearts, bringing us into your rest, a foretaste of eternal rest when we are going to spend eternity with you. Thank you for this gift. Father, we come before you understanding that we are born in our sins. And if knowingly or unknowingly we still sin, we come humbly asking for your forgiveness. We pray through our true intercessor, Jesus Christ, who is in heavenly sanctuary, that you will accept our feeble prayers and you will transform us into his image. May Jesus dwell in each of us, Father. As we are worshiping today, we pray for the transformation of our hearts and minds. Through the spoken word, Father, you reach us, rebuke us, restore us, comfort us, give us hope and confidence that you are with us and you are leading us. Thank you for that. We pray for entire uh, church family, friends, guests, and church members. Father, restore physical health. Restore emotional health. Restore mental health. Restore spiritual health in each of us that in Jesus Christ will be made whole. This morning I will also pray that you will bless our speaker, pastor, Morehouse. Anoint him, Father, with your spirit and let him share with us the words of wisdom, the words of encouragement, the words that would sanctify our hearts, for your words are holy. In Jesus' name we pray. That all we do today here in this sanctuary would have the seal of approval of your Holy Spirit and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray and praise your name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is found in Matthew 23, verses 25 to 26. I invite you to take your Bibles and open up with me to Matthew 23, verses 25 to 26. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and i shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace someday my earthly house will fall i cannot tell how soon it will be but this I know, my all in all, has now a place in heaven for me. Someday when fades the golden sun, beneath the rosy tinted west, my blessed Lord will say well shall enter into rest and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and I shall see him face to face and tell the story Our gracious Lord, how we need you this morning. As we open up your word, I pray that you would give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Guide us to all truth as you have promised and give us that story of grace as a personal experience, we pray. Bless us and guide us, we pray, in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, we discovered Satan's plan to destroy this church. Without anybody really knowing. 
And it was a plan, it is a plan that he has used with great success in completely and totally destroying the religious experience of the Jews. It's a plan that he's used with great success during the Dark Ages to completely and totally destroy the spiritual experience of Roman Catholicism. And he is using the same tactic to seek to destroy the Adventist church. It's called in the Bible a form of godliness without the power of God. You might want to call it playing church without the Holy Spirit. On an individual basis, it could be said that it's a person who looks like a Christian, talks like a Christian, but their heart is in harmony with the world. The Apostle Paul calls it carnal Christianity or to be carnally minded. The Apostle John in Revelation calls it lukewarm Christians. We know, we know that we are carnal Christians or lukewarm or simply have a form of godliness when we can look at our own church or our own lives and see unconverted characters that resemble the world. When we see uh, unforgiveness, bitterness, pride, self-ambition, a secret love of pleasure, headstrong people, a lack of self-control, complaining rather than giving thanks or gossip in our church or in our lives, those are all telltale signs that we have slipped out of the true heart of Christianity and we've slipped into a form of godliness. Because true Christianity isn't just a church. True Christianity isn't, uh, isn't red pews or red benches or red carpet. True Christianity doesn't have simply a stone tower outside. That's not true Christianity. True Christianity isn't just a suit and a tie and a black pair of shoes. That's not Christ true Christianity. True Christianity is what Jesus resembled when he walked and talked on planet Earth. True Christianity is falling on your knees in the mountains and praying all night. So that you'll have the strength to follow God's will during the day. True Christianity is a willingness to rebuke, but a reluctance to break. True Christianity is a heart that asks God to forgive your enemies. Will you cry to the Lord to forgive your enemies because your own heart is broken with forgiveness for them? See, true Christianity is more about what ha has happened inside than just what's going on on the outside. How do you cure, cure a lukewarm Christian what is the antidote to the poison of formalism? This morning I'd like to continue where we left off last week and look a little bit deeper into what the Bible says about the peril of formalism. The truth is that what is needed is an entire shift in our thinking. Why do I say an entire shift in our thinking? Because... It's our thinking that, that sets us up for how we choose to approach religion in general. Um, let me illustrate this from the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 26. Matthew 23, uh, starting in verse 25. 
Matthew 23, Matthew 23, starting in verse 25. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortions and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Here Jesus is showing, uh, revealing two paradigms, two ways of looking at a Christian's walk. The first way is the way that the Pharisees looked at different things. And the Pharisees' paradigm is this. The problem with you and the problem with me and the problem with the church is that we're not doing the things that we should be doing. That's the problem. Sounds good, right? The problem with the church, the problem with you, the problem with me is we're not doing the things that we should be doing. That's the problem. But Jesus said, that's not the problem. And if you think that's the problem, you've missed the problem. The problem isn't that we were not doing the things that we should be doing. That's just the symptom. That's the symptom of the problem. The problem goes deeper than that. And if all you do is treat the symptoms, you'll never be cured. So, see, we oftentimes uh, carry the same paradigm as the Pharisees. We carry it with us from day to day. Oh, I messed up again. I should be doing these things in my, in my life. If only I can get my act straight. If only my church can change and do what it's supposed to be doing, then everything will be okay. But that mindset of thinking is a form of godliness without the power. Because the problem isn't that we do the wrong things. The problem is we are wrong. It's, it's our nature, it's our heart that's wrong. If you fix the inside of the cup, the outside of the cup will be fixed. If you clean the inside of the cup, the outside will be cleansed. It's a change in the way that we look at uh, the problems in our life. And this will revolutionize a church and it will revolutionize the inside of an individual when you begin to look at the problems that you face in your day-to-day -day life as symptoms of the true problem. The true problem is an unconverted heart. The perspective of the Pharisees, the basic problem with humanity is that we do the wrong things. We aren't living right. We need to reform our lives. So in order to address this problem, what do you think the Pharisees did? How do you address the problem of you're not living right? You're not doing the right things. How do you address that problem? How would you address that problem if that were the problem? I'm not doing the right things. How would you address it? See, I'm going to, well, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make a change. I read in the Bible that when I come before the Lord, I need to, um, need to come before Him looking nice. So I'm going to go out and buy something that fits the dress code of the Bible. There, got my suit, my tie. I need to now stop uh, lying because lying, the Bible says lying is a bad thing, right? Don't tell a lie. Okay. Now, every time I think that I want to tell a lie, I just need to bite my tongue. Just bite my tongue. Don't say it. 
Another problem is uh, drinking. You know, I shouldn't drink. I need to give up, give up drinking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the alcohol and I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to throw it all out. Amen. Amen. Cigarettes have to go too. Crumple those up, throw those out. Anything else that I need to change? Cheese and ice cream. Cheese, ice cream, and chocolate cake. So I tell my wife, no more cheese, no more ice cream, no more chocolate cake. We're not going to do it. Not going to do it anymore. You know what we call this? We call this a reform movement. I'm reforming my life. I'm changing my life. There's one problem. At nighttime, I go searching through the trash for the cigarettes and the alcohol and the cheese and the chocolate cake that I threw out because there's something inside of me that is driving me back to it. Now, what's the problem? I thought I threw it all out. I thought it was gone from my life. I've reformed. What's the issue? How come I'm going back to the dumpster digging for my supposed treasures? You see, I changed the outside, but the inside of the cup remained the same. And this is the problem with the Pharisees' paradigm. It's the problem with the form of godliness and it's, and it's this, that all we need to do in religion is make better people out of people. Change the outside. Because if we change the outside and we get everybody doing the right things, we'll be ready for heaven. Jesus says, first cleanse the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be clean. Jesus revealed that their, their perspective was wrong. It's not that the outside wasn't important to Jesus, or that the outside shouldn't be important to us. But for Jesus, the outside wasn't the problem, it's just the symptom. And in order to... Uh, cure the symptom, you have to uh, treat the root cause. The root cause of the disease or the problem. The true problem is an unconverted heart. The problem with our nature. The problem is that we have what Scripture calls a carnal mind. Turn to Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 7. Book of Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 7. Romans 8, 6 through 7 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed what? Can be. Can you be a true Christian and have a carnal mind? No. And the reason why is because the Bible says the carnal mind is enmity against the law of God. It cannot be subject to the law of God. It will not follow the law of God. A demonstration of godliness will not convert the heart. Um. In Early Writings, page 273, it says, Very many who profess to be Christians have not known God. Amen. The natural heart has not been changed, and the carnal mind remains at enmity with God. They are Satan's faithful servants, notwithstanding they have assumed another name. Changing the outside does nothing to prepare us for heaven if there is not an inward change, a true heart conversion as well. Steps to Christ is a beautiful book. Amen. It's a uh, life-changing book. And if you haven't read it in a while, I encourage you to read it because it, it's, this little book starts revivals in people's lives. 
in page 18 of Steps to Christ. It says, education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God and to holiness. So if we focus on the externals of a person's life as the real problem, we can be sure that we have accepted a form of godliness. According to Jesus, focusing on cleaning the inside of the cup is the only true uh, religious experience that he wants for individuals. What, What does Jesus promise if you clean the inside of the cup first? I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 26. Matthew 23, starting in verse 26. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. According to Jesus, if we focus on a true heart conversion, the rest will fall in line. There are some here in this very church who may have been struggling with sins for years and years and years. The same sin. And it keeps coming back over and over and over and over and over again. Anybody ever been in that cycle where it just goes, look at, look at, just about everybody's hand raised. We all know what it's like to, to go over and over and over and try and free ourselves. What's the problem? The problem is we're trying to cleanse the outside of the dish without cleansing the inside. And that's why we can never gain the victory. Because if all we focus on is changing our outside, um, it won't work. Because the inside is so messed up, it will continue to manifest on the outside over and over and over again. What you need is not, uh, not just an outward change, you need a new nature. Desire of Ages, page 172. Desire of Ages, page 172, says, There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old. The Christian's life is not what? That's right. And what does modification mean? It means you take the person as they are and you try to make changes in them. Have you ever had somebody tell you you should be or you should do? What are they trying to do when they say you should be or you should do? They're trying to make modifications in your life. You know, brother, when you come to church, you really should wear a tie. You know, brother or sister, when you come to church, you really shouldn't have your skirt so, so high. You really shouldn't. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. And what, what's... Now, I'm not saying these things aren't, aren't important. And if that's the message you're getting, you're missing my point. My point is we are trying to modify the person without making, making sure they're converted. And if all you do is make those modifications, it does nothing for the salvation of the individual. Absolutely nothing. Notice what she says. The Christian life is not a modification or improvement of the old. And let me tell you, a vegan lifestyle is an improvement over a meat-eating, 
hamburger scarfing, McDonald's subsisting lifestyle. It's an improvement. And, and, and there are many in our world who have made that modification in their life and have received benefits from it. They've thrown out the milk, they've thrown out the cheese, they've thrown out the meat, but they still have a heart that's bound to the world. And they're going to go to hell as vegans. Amen. Is that what we want? We aren't interested in improved people or modified people. We want new people. We want a transformation of nature, a new nature. Because, friends, once you get a new nature, you'll live a new life. Desire of Ages, 172. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. A form of godliness is when you make modifications or improvements to your life without the transformation of nature. If you have not yet experienced a transformed nature, then you are living a form of godliness. Because true Christianity is not the modification or improvement of the human being, it is a transformed nature. And that is something that must happen before the second coming of Jesus in every one of us. Amen. That is the gospel. That Jesus has the power not simply to forgive us. That Jesus doesn't just love us. But that Jesus wants to make us new creatures in, by his power. I'd like to give you an example as I've been through this sermon. An example of a form of godliness would be making sure that people take off their jewelry, pay their tithe, keep the Sabbath holy, wear a suit up front, but you ignore the condition of a person's heart. They can rem remain bitter, they can re remain selfish, they can remain prideful as long as they look the part. Our greatest need is a transformed nature. Now, what is nature? What does it mean? What does nature mean? If you go to Romans chapter 2, verse 14, Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, and why did the Gentiles have not the law? Because the law was in the Jewish scriptures. And where were the Jewish scriptures? In the synagogue. Did the Gentiles go to the Jewish synagogue? They couldn't. They didn't. And they, and they never read the law. Never saw the law. But it says here, when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. By nature. What does that mean, by nature? It means by nature they, they do not do the things that are written in the Ten Commandments. By nature, having never read the Ten Commandments, by nature the Holy Spirit comes and convicts the hearts of these individuals and says, you really shouldn't steal. The person says, I don't want to steal. By nature, they declare that the Spirit of God has written the law in their hearts. Even though they don't have it, they don't have a Bible to read or a church to go to, it's there. By nature, Romans chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, let's skip over that one. Go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3 says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, 
the children of wrath, even as others. By nature. What does it mean, by nature, you're the children of wrath? It means that without even trying, you do the, the things that you know are wrong. Without even trying. Have you ever found yourself in that position where you just kind of, you're walking along and all of a sudden you find yourself uh, watching a thousand different YouTube clips that you know you shouldn't be watching, but by nature you just keep going? Or by nature you begin scrolling through some Facebook feed and you know you shouldn't be there, but you just can't help yourself, you just keep scrolling? Or, or maybe it's by nature, you're playing a video game and you really know you should be doing your homework or cleaning up the yard or doing something else, but by nature you just can't stop. You just keep going and going and going. What's this whole nature thing? It means that you are carrying out the, the lusts and desires of your own heart. By nature. By nature. And we can, the Bible declares that we can either by nature serve ourselves and serve Satan or by nature serve God. But if we're going to have, by nature, serving the Lord, that, has to, that can only happen through conversion. Unless our hearts are converted, we will, by nature, serve ourselves, serve Satan, and, uh, and serve the world. Nature is what you do automatically. You do not need to fight to do it or try really hard to do it. When it is something you do by nature, uh, for instance, by nature, we all eat. Don't we? Yeah. You ever walk by, the count, by a counter, seen a cookie, picked it up without even thinking and put it in your mouth? Yeah. yeah. We've all done that, right? Why? Well, there's an internal compulsion called hunger. And it drives you without you even thinking about it. Uh, by nature, we eat. We desire to eat. And by nature, we'll grab food and put it in our, now, in, our, in our mouth. By nature, we desire and seek for those things that gratify our internal impulses of hunger and thirst and sleep, etc. Our nature is akin to our habits, what we do repetitively without trying to. We just do it by nature. It's our internal programming, what we are drawn to think on, speak of, or practice in. The impulses and drives that propel you in one direction or another. That's your nature. Okay, that's your nature. Autopilot, we might call it. We were all born with fallen sinful natures, meaning we are prone towards sin from birth. Our greatest need is a new nature that is prone towards righteousness. Jesus pointed this out in his midnight conversation with Nicodemus. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3 and verse 3. John 3, verse 3. John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, being born again is a concept that the Jews had. Anytime somebody converted from outside of Judaism into Judaism, whether even if they were an adult, and they converted as an adult from being a, a Gentile, non-faith believing whatever in the world, and they convert to Judaism, the Jews said that person has just been born again. They've received the new birth. They've, they're entering into a new life, the Jewish life. What a surprise it was for Nicodemus, who was a Jew from birth, for Christ to say to him, it doesn't matter what positions you hold in the church. It doesn't matter the color of the robes you wear on the Sabbath day. It doesn't matter how strictly you follow the kosher laws unless you are born again you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus saw what Nicodemus knew but struggled to admit. 
his inward nature struggled with and craved sin, even though many of his actions had the appearance of godliness. You see, Nicodemus had the problem we all have. He may have looked at salvation only through the lens of forgiveness, but not through the lens of transformation. It would have been easy to do. The entire salvation system was built on the sanctuary service. And what did the priests do for the sins of the people each day? What did they do? They offered sacrifices. Sacrifices were made morning and evening, each and every day. A sacrifice was made to atone for the sins of the people that God might grant them forgiveness. Now the people were daily reminded that salvation meant forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of the Lamb. They didn't carry it forward and recognize the significance in Christ. They needed forgiveness, pardon, propitiation for their sins. Sins committed needed to be atoned for through death. However, Jesus now touches on a human need which is little recognized. How often did the people need to receive forgiveness for their sins? How often? Every day. In fact, multiple times in the day. Yeah. If every angry word, every impure and unholy thought were judged, if, if the attitudes of impatience and rudeness must be forgiven, if every wrong you did must receive forgiveness, how often would you need to go and seek for forgiveness? Every day, probably every hour. Everyone knows it, but few want to admit that the biggest human dilemma is not our need for forgiveness, but our need for transformation. Daily the Jews were reminded with each and every sacrifice, morning and evening, that they had a greater problem than simply messing up and committing sins. Perhaps one day, on day one, you mess up and you say, you know what, I really need, to be, I really need forgiveness. I've, I've messed up, I've you know, yelled when I shouldn't have yelled, I've cursed when I shouldn't have cursed, I, I uh, did all these things, I need forgiveness, let me take a lamb, you go to the sanctuary, you offer the lamb, you receive the assurance that you are forgiven, a smile broadens your face, you walk away from the sanctuary, you're feeling really good when all of a sudden uh, a camel walks right in front, in front of you in the street and at that very moment uh, the camel drops some things on the street and you step in those things and get it all in your sandals and you start cursing and you're just leaving the temple and you think to yourself, I've got to go right back to the temple and offer another lamb. So you go back to the temple, you offer another lamb and you think, whew, I'm good now, I can leave, I'm forgiven. And you go back <clears throat> out in the street, you go down the road, you go to your house and you get home and you realize that your kids have gotten into your tools and have... Uh, lost them all in the river. They were throwing, spl playing splashing games in the river. I don't know, I'm making this up. So all your tools are in the river and you lose it again. Oh man, you've, you've really lost it. And you have to go back to the temple again. And you go back time and time and time again. It's not long before you realize that forgiveness is just, just isn't cutting it. Do you see? It just, it's nice to be forgiven, but what you really need is to be transformed. You need to have the gifts of the Spirit of self control and patience and long suffering and kindness and mercy. You need those things inside of you by nature. And this is what Jesus was speaking to when he talked to the Pharisees. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I want you to notice that this verse isn't saying that we do bad things. This verse is saying that we love to do bad things. That's the problem. Our very core nature is in a state of continual rebellion against God. We crave what is not good for us. We long and lust for sin. That's the problem. Amen. 
in a Laodicean church. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, of us all. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12 says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Humanity's greatest problem has been totally and utterly misrepresented not only by the Jewish econ econ economy <coughs> that Nicodemus was part of, but by the Christian church as a whole today. There are thousands of pastors who preach and millions of people today who believe that all humanity needs is forgiveness. Jesus' statement to Nicodemus drops a nuclear bomb on this theory. <clears throat> Those most, the most misapplied text in all of the Bible is John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Preachers get up front in pulpits and placate us into believing that the greatest need of humanity is to feel loved and be forgiven. That sort of message will certainly leave me feeling good in the moment, but it doesn't get at the root of the problem. The root of the problem is how do I stop sinning? How do I stop doing the things I always do that I know are wrong? How do I break the cycle? How do I get out? And some people believe that the only way to break the cycle is through suicide. That's the only way they can get out of that, that going round and round and round. And they don't realize the truth of the Bible is that Jesus can set you free. Jesus can break that cycle. You can have a transformed nature. You can live a new life. It can happen. Millions of people long to be free from sin. And the best thing that some preachers can say is, well, brother, God loves you and forgives you, but is completely and totally incapable of fixing you. You are doomed to being a repeat sinner until the second coming. Sorry, but that's the best gospel I have. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came to save us from sin. Is this the hope we have to offer people? Is God so powerless and impotent that all He can do is love me and forgive me, but He cannot reach and cleanse my soul? Don't be deceived. If a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, preacher, administrator, or member communicates in any way that we are simply saved in our sins and not from our sins, that person does not know the power of the true gospel. Matthew 1, verse 21, the angel said, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people, not in their sins, but from their sins. That means it's no longer going to hold on to them. It's not, no longer going to pull them down into the grave. Jesus is going to break those chains and that person is going to walk free. F by free, we mean walk in the law of the Lord. Because that is true freedom. Satan has twisted it saying that the law of the Lord is bondage, but the law of God is freedom. But it's only freedom to those who are converted. To the unconverted soul, the law is the most hateful bondage that you could possibly place on somebody. You know why? Because the law says you need to live righteous, but your heart says it's impossible because you don't have a divine nature. And that is why so many hate the law of God, because they have not yet been fully converted. But friends, when you're converted, you can say with David, oh, how I love thy law. I meditate on it day and night. It's a delight. The law of God is a delight because you are now fulfilling by nature the righteous requirements of God. And it can happen for you and for me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
What about somebody who has been stuck in the cycle of sin for decades? Does that anyone apply to him, to her? You bet. What about somebody who has been living a life of sin, but they're on their deathbed? Does that anyone apply to them? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Ellen White talks about abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ, you know that concept of abiding in Christ? You need to be in Christ. This verse says, if anyone is in Christ, John chapter 15 says, if anyone abides in me, my word, and my word abides in him, he shall bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Abiding in Christ. How do I abide in Christ? Ellen White in Desire of Ages, says that abiding in Christ is being daily filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I need the Holy Spirit in my life if I'm going to abide in Christ and be a new creation. And I need to pray for it not just once or twice. I need to pray for it every single day. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, starting in verse 4. It says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. I'm not preaching opinion, I'm quoting scripture. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who, he who has died has been freed from sin. Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Ezekiel, I'm going to go through a couple more texts here. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. When will we walk in God's statutes or laws? After we are given what? A new heart. Are you praying daily for the Holy Spirit to come into your life and to transform you and give you a new heart? Are you praying every day for that conversion that only heaven can bring? Are you asking... Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. How does he live in you? Through the Holy Spirit. When, we, when the Holy Spirit fills your life, this is the greatest gift that can be given to God's church. Amen. The greatest and most precious gift that is given to God's people is the gift of the Holy Spirit. But how little we pray for it. How little we ask of it. How little you hear it preached of. We need the Holy Spirit now because with the Holy Spirit comes every other gift. Amen. When you receive the Holy Spirit. We should be asking daily, Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. 
that, and when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, what he does is he takes the life of Jesus and begins living the life of Jesus through you. That's what happens. That's conversion. I have been crucified with Christ. Me, I, pride, self, my plans, my desires, all have been crucified with Christ. I've laid them down. I no longer have my own will for my life. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5, 6 through 8. Ephesians 5, 6 through 8. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is all talking about the new birth experience, conversion, something all of us need. This is why Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, you need to be forgiven. Jesus didn't say you need to be forgiven. He said you need a new birth. John 3, verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism by water does not equal a new birth. Let me say that again. Baptism by water, that tank up there, Baptism by water does not equal a new birth. Maybe some think that that's heresy. Let me read to you what manuscript release 148, page 1890, or date 1897 says. Ellen White says, The new birth is a rare experience in this age of the world. This is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches. Many, so many, who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die, and therefore they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. Let me repeat my heresy that I just spoke a few minutes ago. Baptism by water does not equal a new birth. You can be baptized and not converted, fully converted. Now hopefully you are converted when you're baptized. And it's important that every person eventually is baptized. Because baptism shows the world and declares to Christ... This is my commitment to you. I'm following you. I'm laying everything on the altar. This is my outward commitment uh, resembling or reflecting the inward change. But what we need is not simply baptism by water, but we need also baptism by the Spirit. The two must come together. We cannot be born again without the Spirit of God. We cannot have new natures without the Spirit of God. How do we know this? John 3, 7 through 8, Jesus continues and says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be born again? means that you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life to transform you and give you the nature of God. Ye shall receive power, page 221. Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church, but how little is this promise appreciated? How seldom is the Spirit's power felt in the church? How little is his power spoken of before the people? The Savior has said... 
Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. With the reception of this gift, which gift is that? The Holy Spirit. All other gifts would be ours. For we are to have this gift according to the plentitude of the riches of the graces of Christ. And he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. So if in order to have a new nature we need the Holy Spirit, how do we get the Holy Spirit? Go to Luke chapter 11. We're going to find out that Brother Brooks is right. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Let's read it together. Turn there. Luke 11, verse 13. All right, you ready? Let's read it together. Let's go. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? In the Greek, that word ask is in the present continuous tense. How do you, how do you understand that? It, the present continuous tense means not just ask once, but ask and continue to ask over and over and over and over. This verse could read, uh, the Heavenly Father is willing to give the Holy Spirit to them who continue to ask over and over and over for His Spirit. If we ask and yearn for and desire the Spirit of God daily, God will give us His Spirit. How do I know? He's promised us. If you ask, He'll give it. We need to ask and ask and ask and ask every day. You know, many times we have prayer meetings and we get together maybe like for New Year's or January and we all get together and we, we get together to pray for the Holy Spirit. And we pray and we pray and we pray for the Holy Spirit and we may pray for 40 days for the Holy Spirit. But at some time during that time we say, okay, I've, pray, I've done my job. I prayed for the Holy Spirit. I prayed for the outpouring of God's Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit. I'm done. I'm ready to move on to other things. But the Bible teaches us not to pray for the Holy Spirit once in a while. The Bible says we need to ask and ask and ask and ask. We need to pray for it every single day. And if we are going to be converted every day, we need to ask for the Holy Spirit every day. In fact, this is what Jesus himself did. In Review and Herald, August 11, 1910, it says, From hours spent with God, Jesus came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily, he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. How often was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Daily. And if our Savior, the sinless one of God, felt a need to be daily baptized by the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit? Acts of the Apostles, page 56. To the consecrated worker, there is a wonderful consolation in the knowledge that even Christ during his life on earth sought his Father daily for fresh supplies of needed grace. And from this communion with God, he went forth to strengthen and bless others. Behold, the Son of God bowed in prayer to his Father. Though he is the Son of God, he strengthens his faith by prayer and by communion with heaven, gathers to himself power to resist evil and to minister to the needs of men. As the elder brother of our race, he knows the necessities of those who, compassed with infirmity and living in a world of sin and temptation, still desire to serve him. He knows that the messengers whom he sees fit to send are weak, erring men. But to all who give themselves wholly to his service, he promises divine aid. His own example is an assurance that earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God and unreserved consecration to His work 
will avail to bring to men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against sin. Child Guidance, page 548, says, Be sure that you are converted every day. Once you take this new perspective that the things we do are simply symptoms of a heart problem, it will change your walk with God. Instead of pouring all of your energies uh, into trying to reform your life, you will pour all your energies into seeking for the Holy Spirit and a new heart. Amen. It's not saying that you're not going to walk away from sin. In fact, the Bible gives us the assurance that those who are converted will be freed from sin, Amen. will walk away from sin, will live a life in harmony with the law of God. But when you change your perspective, you'll begin living differently and you'll experience that victory that the Lord has promised to each one of us. When you change your, expe your experience, you'll begin to relate to people differently. No longer will you look for the sins and errors in the lives of other people. No longer will you point out to people the things that they need to change in their life. You're going to start praying more for individuals. Amen. Asking for the Holy Spirit to come into these people's lives. Realizing that unless their heart is converted, it won't make a lick of difference what sort of outward changes they make. For they will not see the kingdom of God unless they have a converted heart. In fact, why else would Jesus tell us to pray for our enemies? If he didn't expect that those individuals needed an inward change. You see, taking on Jesus' mentality totally changes the way you relate to people. I'd like to close with a story in the Bible. It's found in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and it's the story of a demon-possessed man. Mark chapter 5, it says in verse 1, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When Jesus saw him from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And cried out with a loud voice saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by, by God that you do not torment me. And he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered and said, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs or the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see uh, what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legions. He was sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their, from their region. You've read it now from the Bible. Let me share it with you from several different perspectives. 
Jesus comes to a place he's never been before when suddenly he sees a man who's completely out of his mind. I mean, this guy has long hair. And he sits there and cuts himself all day. He's a nudist. He doesn't wear any clothes. He has a snarling face. He yells at people all the time. He screams in the mountains, probably keeping the neighborhood awake till late in the night. Jesus could have looked at this man and pointed out every problem in his life. You know, in the land of Judea, the home of the Jews, you really should be wearing clothes. We don't do nudity here in this place. You know, it's not good to cut yourself. You really should stop cutting yourself. You know, you really should stop screaming and yelling at people because it doesn't do any good and you just look like a fool. Stop screaming and yelling at people. Jesus could have gone to this man and told him all of these things and let me ask you, and you, you know the obvious, the answer is obvious. What would it have done for this man if Jesus would have listed all his problems and told him to change? Go ahead, tell me, what would it have done? It's obvious, isn't it? It would have done nothing to save that person, and yet we do that very same thing to ourselves and to others. We walk around saying, man, I really should do this, I really should do that, I need to change this in my life, I need to change that in my life, or we tell other people, you really need to do this. You really need to do that. You really need to change these sorts of things. And you know what we, we accomplish? A big zero. Why? Because we're still cleaning the outside of the bowl rather than cleaning the inside of the bowl. Jesus did something different. Before Jesus presented this man with health reform, dress reform worship reform and all the other reforms, before Jesus presented the reforms to the man, he set him free. He cast the demons out of the man. He dealt with the root problem. And once Jesus dealt with the root problem, did he need to preach about all these reforms? What happened to the man? His mind became clear. He put on clothes that were appropriate. His whole life changed because Jesus dealt with the root problem. And that is what Jesus wants to do in this church, in your lives, and in this world. He wants to deal with the root problem, and the root problem is a sin-filled heart. We need a new heart. How do we get a new heart? We need to ask. For a new heart. Every day we need to be asking for the Holy Spirit. Are you praying for the Holy Spirit every day? Are you asking for a conversion every day? You know, it's only those who feel that they have nothing that will ask for something. Do you feel that unless you're converted today, Unless you're converted today, you have nothing. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'd like to make an appeal this afternoon. And the appeal is simply this. To say, Lord, I need a new heart. And I need your Holy Spirit in my life. And I need to begin looking at the root problem rather than all of the symptoms and deal with what's really, truly going on in my life. Is that your desire this morning? Why don't you join me in kneeling and we'll ask for that together. Heavenly Father, we believe and know this morning that the problem is not 
is not that we keep doing the things we shouldn't do. The problem, the problem is that we can't stop. And Lord, oh, how much we want to stop. We want to break out of that cycle. But today we want to confess before you that human effort alone is worthless in changing our heart. We need the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And you've come to us and told us that if we ask, all we need to do is ask, and you will give us the Holy Spirit. Lord, here we are, not holding anything back from you. Have your will and way in our life. We just need your Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our church. Please give us the gift of the Holy Spirit today. Give us a renewed heart, a changed heart, a new nature, heaven's nature. Please, Lord, make this change inside of us. And Lord, we promise today that this won't be the only time that we will ask. We commit to you today, Lord, that tomorrow we will ask and the next day we will ask and the next day we will ask for your Holy Spirit until we reflect Jesus through and through. And Lord, help us to pray for those in our life who uh, disturb us with their lifestyle. Help us to pray for them and not to criticize them. And I pray that you would hear our prayers for these individuals, just like you heard Jesus' prayers for his disciples. And that you would bring your converting influence in their life as well. We ask for a revival here, Lord, because we need one. We ask for this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Hymn 569. Is that? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, the privilege of seeking your face and being filled with your spirit. We pray for this spirit, Lord, and I pray that you would bless each one of us as we leave this sanctuary, that we might uh, walk in this world as converted Christians. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. 